the history of the department takes us back as far as 1860. 1860, obviously before the Civil War, was a, a time of not of organization like you see now. It was more or less uh, un, untrained uh, bucket brigades of just people of the town trying to do good to save themselves from fire. Uh, as it progressed on, the department was organized in 1872, which even still at that time, uh, it was a formal organization but it was still left a lot to be desired as far as the formal training and so forth. The department over the years uh, reorganized several times, 1879 it reorganized and then again in 1900, at which time they increased the manpower from uh, like 25 to 40, uh, and they increased the training and so forth, but uh, nowhere near like what you see today when, you, when we speak of training. We're, in training, we're speaking of a few hours of training as opposed to hundreds and thousands of hours like you see today. The, the footprint of it is, is the city actually burned down twice. The city burned down in 1860 and then burned again in 1886. It burned the entire center core of the city. After the second, uh, after the first fire, uh, the, the town commissioners got together and, and they decided they would purchase the, the steam engine you see here. And, and in the time of need, the city had lots of bigger fires and fortunately we didn't burn the town down in between those but uh, we would call for help from, from uh, Wilmington, Delaware a lot, Crisfield, Pocomo and they would bring the steamers on what they called a fast rail car. They would load them up and, and get them here pretty quick. Uh, so the city commissioners seeing this they saw the you know bucket brigade versus a steam engine and so forth they saw the, the need for that so they voted in 1879, they voted to purchase it for $4,100 and, and have it in the department along with two hose reels and you know the necessary equipment to go with it. The downfall was uh, they got this nice piece of equipment in 1879 and then fire broke out again in 1886 and when they pulled the steamer to the fire, it failed to work. The reason it failed to work was they had failed to do maintenance. It's a very integral piece of equipment <clears throat> in which maintenance has to be done and uh, it, it did, not, did not work and uh, the, the fire grew and grew and grew and they didn't get that piece working until the next day. Uh, by that time, most of the damage was over and Crisfield and Wilmington and all were, were here. Once they got this, the, obviously they had some more fires and they were able to get this thing. It redeemed itself on a lot, lot more bigger fires and then, then they took and they purchased. The city almost burned down a third time in March of 1889. Uh, right behind us where, where you see the farmers and planters in that area, there was a thing called Jackson's Mill, huge mill, and it caught fire. And, and uh, seeing they had this steamer down there and seeing that, you know, this fire was growing, the Greer Brothers, which was, you know, of R.D. Greer today, they had purchased a used steamer from Reading, Pennsylvania for resale to Snow Hill Fire Department. And it was just sitting there. So at the time, Mr. Greer, who happened to be the chief, told him to go get it, and he brought it down, and they saved the city. So the fire department at that time decided that they would purchase that for $1,200, and they kept it until 1921 when it was sold to Lewis, Delaware. Uh, so there, there was a history of it. When I first got into the history part, they always spoke of it and written, but there were never any pictures. And one of the greatest mysteries of this is you never see the two steamers photographed together. You can look at any of the pictures we have here, group shots, they're never together. The piece you see here on my left, the 1916 La France, the motorized age came. This was the first uh, motorized piece of equipment that was on the eastern shore and uh, served the city well. Uh, didn't, didn't take it out of service until about 1962-63. Through the history of the department, it has evolved into the department that we have today, which is a combination career and volunteer service. Um, Many significant events in the history of the city of Salisbury has kind of played a part in transforming the organization into what it is today based on needs and what our citizens uh, require of us as a service. We are a fully, um, we're a full service fire department that includes fire, rescue, emergency medical services, and technical rescue to include hazardous materials, confined space rescue, trench rescue, uh, high angle rescue, uh, swift and flood water rescue. Uh, we provide all of those services uh, with the personnel that we have. The department has progressed up now 135 years old. Uh, went from one station now to three uh, with multiple apparatus of every design from fire to ladders to rescue, 
brush trucks uh, and hazmat units, even trench rescues and so forth. So it's uh, dramatically different than, than what it was when it started. David Haynes, acting lieutenant with the uh, Salisbury Fire Department and uh, instructor with the Maryland Fire and Rescue Institute. And we're here today doing the uh, annual SCBA research for the Salisbury Fire Department. All of our members go through an annual recertification with their SCBA, including uh, live fire evolutions, where we go in uh, wearing full gear and BA. They do an evolution where they knock the fire and do a fire attack upstairs, and they do a search and rescue evolution downstairs. There's a couple of people in there that we had to search for, some uh, life-size, life-weighted dummies and uh, it can be very difficult to get them out, climbing underneath racks that are on fire and things like that to get to them. But uh, it's one of those things we feel like we need to train on to make sure we can do it in reality. Today was the ladder exercise portion of the Volunteer Fire Academy. Uh, recruit class. Uh, we did uh, everything from uh, going over the ground ladders to what they are to how to throw them or how to place them, how to climb, how to climb with tools, how to uh, extend the extension ladders. Uh, we went over some techniques on rescuing a victim from, the, from a window from a, an elevated position. Uh, and then we finished the day up with uh, setting up multiple ladders and having them climb from one ladder up, come out of a window, down a ladder, then up some other ladders and just uh, worked around the tower, the training tower that we have. Yep. <laughs> Salisbury University Carruthers Hall is in the process of uh, demolition. So they, they graciously donated it to us. Uh, obviously we can't you know, go to normal businesses, normal hours, so this is the best time. These are doors they're no longer gonna use. Uh, we're able to come in here and, and have multiple doors to practice on where you may only get to do it once every six months. We're able to do multiples right now. What the, what the crews are doing, it's called through the lock method. They're taking uh, the doors that obviously have been donated here at the university. They're putting what's called a K tool over it. They take and drop the K tool over and lift it. It basically pulls the cylinder, which is uh, screwed into the door. They pull it out and they, they replicate the mechanism for tripping it. We have tools that we just go inside, trip it as if we had a key. Uh, it's called through the lock method. It's uh, much more effective you know, than if we took an ax or anything and busted it down. We can just pull the cylinder. Cylinder like that is less than $20 to replace and the door stays intact. We just pull that, reach in, trip it. Nobody knows we're ever there. Okay. Sometimes you can even screw it back. We got a report of a, a structure fire obviously pulled in here in the middle of the block. We had heavy smoke into the attic. Uh, obstacles, we had a van parked right in the middle of the street. Uh, had to 
not occupied. We had to find out whose it was to get the engine in. Uh, heavy involvement into the attic. It's a T-style, old-style turn-of-the-century house. Uh, once the crews got the lines in there, encountered heavy fire, it was banking down the stairways at them. The truck crew was able to get in on the uh, D side. They were able to vent multiple holes, get some of that load off them. They had a fire break out in the rear. They were able to knock that down. They had to come down and then get into the front side of the house and knock that. They got it at right the right time. The fire had broken through, had exposure to the house here on the D side. Uh, we were getting ready with a two and a half to, to knock it if we had to. But they got water on it just at the right time. Right now, they're just chasing fire. The report was they had a maintenance crew here this afternoon, and what ended up happening, apparently, they saw sparks in the wall at that time and didn't call us. So we're letting the fire marshals do that. They're just arriving on scene. Uh, a total of five people living in the residence. Uh, they'll all be seen by the Red Cross. But all in all, great job by everybody. Pretty tense in the beginning, but uh, everybody did a good job. While some would say that we've had an economic turnaround, um, it, we're, we're still lagging way behind as it relates to the turnaround and, and, the, and the, the recession is still uh, very real for us as, and the economic conditions really haven't changed. They've stabilized, but they haven't changed to the point where the city is, um, in my opinion, in a position where they can fully fund 12 uh, brand new positions. The SAFER grant uh, is, is what we've been fortunate enough to have for about a year and a half. Uh, to give you a little background, we, we encountered during uh, the, the budget crisis of about three and a half to four years ago, we encountered multiple furloughs in which, uh, for example, person in my position had eight shifts that mandatory that we were gone from here. Uh, you know, I say gone from here. Uh, they, they did not pay you. Sometimes, you know, you, you had to take off in other positions you were here, but the furloughs spurred part of it. The, the grant is funded through the federal government to pay for um, personnel services. That's, that's to hire firefighters and, and rescue and EMS folks uh, for communities that can't otherwise afford it. Um, it's really come into play recently for, for during the, the most recent economic uh, issues that the country has faced since uh, 2010. Um, and it's so it's really been a huge help for municipalities and small communities to be able to continue to fund uh, or fund laid up uh, positions that have been either um, gone through layoffs or attrition and not replaced because of budget restrictions and because of economic conditions that prohibit a municipality or a small community from funding those positions. We had frozen positions. These are positions where people had, had been employed here, worked here, but they're, they're, when they left, for whatever reason, their, their positions were not filled. So at one time we had upwards of four of those. Well, when that happened, it kept us from being able to staff one of our daytime crews. Uh, we had to shut down one of our fire stations that had been opened up, and, and that was fire station number one. Um, it was, and it was staffed Monday through Friday between the hours of 7 and 5 uh, p.m., 7 a.m., 5 p.m. Um, and because we lost those three positions be, due to the economic conditions, because we lost them, we had to shut that fire station down, which meant we went from having three staffed fire stations during the day to only two. And so the, the benefit of the SAFER uh, uh, grant was to allow us to open fire station number one back up, uh, un basically unfreeze those positions with grant money, and then to hire an additional nine f uh, firefighters to help us supplement our staff to increase the staff to levels that um, uh, would, in would ensure that we would have a minimum staffing standard on all, all of our equipment that met national standards such as National Fire Protection Agency's uh, minimum staffing standard of four. That was really the purpose of the grant and it has, it has done its job. It, it's, it's, done, it's, it's allowed us to do all of the things that we asked for it to do, um, but that uh, grant has a uh, window of opportunity that's closing rapidly. And those rounds of, of funding will be coming up here in the very next few months uh, and there is no certainty as to one whether we'll get it uh, you know, when we reapply and there is no certainty as to whether it will fall uh, that grant ends October the 22nd, and there is no guarantee that that, that will be refunded. Uh, no, that will be refunded in those positions. We just we just don't know that. In the event that we apply for uh, the grant and are successful, we don't know when that funding will come available. 
if it becomes available in uh, before October, then we're golden. But if it if if we don't get awarded our grant until January or February, there's a gap there that's unfunded, and therefore all of those firefighters would then go away if they weren't funded by the city. In the meantime, we're planning now as to what we will do, you know, how we will fill those gaps, whether we'll go back to the system that we had before and just keep our fingers crossed. But um, the men and women of the department are doing more now than they ever have. Um, they're, they're doing it to, to keep the boat afloat, I guess you would say, and to serve the citizens. Uh, little did I know when I came here 35 years ago, you only had in, in the station I worked in only about 500 calls, 525, and the ambulance calls were roughly only about 2,000. And to see it now at about 9,000 and, and then 3,000 some fires, you can only wonder where it's going from here because the, the town has grown into 33,000 people. It balloons in the daytime for the shopping and whatever the event is to about 110 to 120,000 people that we serve. There are, there are a number of motivators that drive any of us to do anything, uh, but l loving what you do and having a passion for what you do is the most important thing. It, it, and I would equate it to anything that uh, we, we endeavor to do in our lives. If, we're, if we love it and we're passionate about it, we'll put our heart and souls into it. I think it's driven by a, a lot of um, one common goal of just serving the citizens. I think that's the, the main thing that everybody, when they come here, they want to do some good. They want to do something to help somebody. I think that drives them all, how, never, how old they are, how young they are. The, the fire service, the emergency services in general, whether it's police, fire, EMS, doesn't matter, is driven on the, on the desire to serve uh, people and to help them and help and assist people in their times of need. Um, the fire service, EMS personnel, um, certainly don't, don't do it to get rich. As a matter of fact, some people, some, a great deal of the firefighters across the nation volunteer to do it. So it's, it's, it's all driven on this love and compassion and, and desire to serve the public uh, to, with, with very compassionate service and to uh, simply go out and fix, help them fix their problems. I'm, a, I'm an adrenaline, adrenaline junkie. And uh, that's what's kept me going. My bills have always been paid and I've lived a decent lifestyle and I wouldn't have it any other way. And uh, I've, I'm the third of four generations of my family to serve the city. And I know I have a son that's 27 and he's pretty much geared the same way. In a firefighter's career, you, 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 see, you see a lot of things. Uh, we, you know, generally a firefighter will gauge his career on the big one. You know, what is the big one in your career? In my career, it happened to be the Riverside Medical Park, um, 1993, I think, um, uh, which, which was, it was just a huge multiple day fire that, uh, that occurred. And, um, and, you know, I happened to be on the first in engine into that, uh, into that particular fire. Uh, it was very memorable uh, for me. Over the years, I've had, um, I've had critical parts of, uh, some were loss of life. Uh, just recently, we had a fire February 7th. Two people uh, perished in a fire. Uh, from station one, we responded with the engine tanker uh, per the request of Assistant Chief Records. Uh, arrived on location uh, after engine 16 had made two rescues, uh, and they're in the process of performing CPR on both of the victims. Uh, both were transported priority one to the hospital uh, and later succumbed to their injuries. Um, it was, uh, it was interesting in that, you know, we get there and obviously we've got two rescues that we need to make. The engine pulls up and they're a little short staffed as far as trying to extinguish the fire and make the rescues. Uh, so on our arrival, it was, you know, whatever we can do to assist them and, you know, it was, it was intense. Uh, but when you're in charge of a fire like that and you go back into the neighborhood a few days later and you check the smoke detectors and you find that 27 uh, homes within that area had no detector. Kind of feel like the cards are stacked against you. You know, I was just happy to be there and help that, those guys and, and be a part of the team. You know, and you know, really see what the department's all about, the brotherhood, and you know how we all come together and you know get done what we need to get done and take care of the job. Whether it's it's witnessing tragedy and loss of life, or you know dealing with uh, 
huge uh, weather related events, hurricanes, snowstorms, uh, all of those things play uh, really a, a huge part in developing a career. It's a very exciting time for the Salisbury Fire Service and, and really let me tell you why. With 2,986 fire calls last year and 8,809 EMS calls, we are uh, the big department here on Delmarva. In this year's budget, we hope to unfreeze two firefighter paramedic positions that have been frozen since 2010. We will again apply for our safer grant funding for funding for our new firefighters and we will God willing and the creek doesn't rise, we will break ground at a new fire station number two on Brown Street. That's good stuff, my friends. Bronze Star. Awarded to members who in the course of firefighting or rescue operations perform acts of exceptional intelligence and bravery while saving or attempting to save the lives of others with serious risk to themselves. February the 7th, 2014, 413 Patrick Avenue, Departmental Commendation, Bronze Star. At 0458 hours, Salisbury units responded to reported structure fire with possible persons trapped. Arriving units found a one-story wood frame duplex with fire sharing from windows on the right rear corner and involvement into the attic. Assistant Chief Records was immediately notified by neighbors that the occupants were still inside. Engine 161 was directed to stretch a hose line to the rear of the structure and extinguish the main body of fire. Firefighter Engel was directed to vent the windows in the immediate area where the victims were reported to be located. Firefighter McLean and Firefighter Helmuth were directed to force entry into the side door and initiate a search. At the same time, Acting Lieutenant Cox initiated a quick search of the front room in the front of the house. Within seconds, Acting Lieutenant Cox located an unconscious female and was assisted by Lieutenant Twilley was removing the victim. Seconds later, Firefighter McLean and Helmuth located a second victim in the hallway near the fire room. Both patients were removed to waiting ambulances where advanced life support was initiated and they were transported to PRMC. Despite the heroic efforts of these brave members, the male patient was pronounced dead at Peninsula Regional Medical Center. The female patient regained a pulse on arrival at PRMC, but sadly also passed away two days later. Acting Lieutenant Cox, Firefighter McLean, and Firefighter Helmuth entered the structure without the immediate protection of a hose line. Their quick actions with the assistance of Paramedic 2, Paramedic 16, and Paramedic 16-1 resulted in the successful removal of both trapped occupants within minutes of arrival. Although both victims succumbed to their injuries, the quick actions of these members gave the family great peace in knowing their loved ones received a fighting chance at life. Their efforts bring great credit to themselves, to the fire service in general, and especially to the city of Salisbury, fire and EMS.